So welcome back to the natural language processing course. Uh, the next section is going to be on dependency parsing. Everything that we talked about parsing so far had to deal with uh, uh, constituent parsing. And interestingly enough, for many years, perhaps for decades, that was the prevalent kind of parsing. Uh, in the last few years, maybe 10 years or so, uh, it has become more fashionable to use instead of constituency parsing, something called dependency parsing. Uh, it's a simpler method and it achieves very good accuracy for many different NLP tasks. So what is dependency parsing? Before I can talk about dependency parsing, let me explain what is the dependency structure of a sentence. Let's consider a simple noun phrase such as blue house. This is a noun phrase and its head is the noun house and blue somehow modifies house. But the entire phrase is a type of house, it's not the type of blue. So we have a dependency between house and blue, where house is the root of the tree and blue is a modifier or some sort of additional information that gets added to house to specify it. So the terminology used in uh, linguistics is the following. The word blue in this example is called either a modifier or a dependent or a child or a subordinate. And the word house, which is the head, can also be called the governor, the parent or the region. So you can see all of those terms used in the different kinds of literature. Let's look at the more specific, uh, more complicated sentence. We have unionized workers are usually better paid than their union, non-union counterparts. We want to build an entire structure for the sentence uh, based on the dependencies between adjacent words. So the word paid is considered to be the most important word in the sentence. It's the main predicate, you know, the main verb. Its subject is workers, so there is a dependency between paid and workers, with paid, paid as the head and workers as the dependent. Workers itself is modified by the word unionized, which tells you what kind of workers we are talking about. And so on. You can fill out the entire chart by adding dependencies that cover all of the words. And as you can see, uh, the word paid doesn't have any parent uh, because it's the root of the uh, sentence. There's another notation that people use for dependencies. Uh, you can have the verb at, on top, uh, VBN in this example, paid, and then it's children labeled with the different types of dependencies. For example, prepositional phrase, adverbial modifier, uh, noun subject, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so you can also notice that there is some connection between the dependency structure of the sentence and the phrase structure of the sentence. So I'm going to alternate between those two slides for a second. This is the phrase structure where uh, the sentence turns into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Here's the equivalent uh, dependency structure where the verb is at the top. It turns out that there are some methods which can take a uh, structure like this one here and use the so-called head rules to convert it into a dependency structure automatically. So what is a dependency grammar? Uh, it's a grammar that captures lexical and syntactic dependencies between words. And the top level predicate of the sentence becomes the root of the parse tree. And they're much simpler to parse than context free grammars. And they're very useful for languages that have free word order, such as Czech and Latin. So how do we identify the heads uh, in a pair of words? Well, let's use this terminology, H for head and for modifier. So in general, if you have to choose which one is the head, you can use the following principles. H determines the syntactic category of the construct, or H determines the semantic category of the construct. H can be required, whereas M can be skipped. So in the example, blue house, house cannot be skipped. That's the head. M uh, or blue can be skipped. And they may also be uh, given a specific type of dependency. There may be a fixed linear position of the modifier with respect to the head. So, for example, an adjective can modify the noun right next to it. So, here's an example of a list of rules that come from uh, Michael Collins's PhD dissertation. Uh, you can see that in every case, you have a parent non terminal and a list of priority children. So, let's look at an example. For example, for S, we may have the following children uh, constituents, to and in, which are different kinds of prepositions, a verb phrase, uh, another sentence, S bar, adjectival phrase, and so on. 
And then the rules, according to Collins, are to pick the first one on this list that appears. So, for example, if we can choose between a verb phrase and a preposition, we're going to pick the preposition. If there are no prepositions, if we have to choose, let's say, between a verb phrase and a sentence, we would pick the verb phrase because it appears on the left here, and so on. Now, you should also notice that some of those uh, directions are going the other way. So, for example, for adjectival phrase, we go left to right, but for adverbial phrase, we go right to left. So, if there's more than one candidate with the same label among the children, we're going to pick the one that comes to the right instead of the one that comes to the left. So, here are some of the main techniques for dependency parsing. The first type are based on dynamic programming. They use methods similar to CKY. Uh, and they have cubic complexity. Uh, uh, there was one famous paper by Jason Eisner in Calling 96, which shows why this is the case. So here's an example of a sentence in dependency representation. Mary likes cats. So the predicate of the sentence is likes. And the two arguments or the two modifiers of likes are Mary and cats. So we can build this kind of tree by using dynamic programming, starting with uh, uh, the equivalent of a CKY parser. And in each case, propagate uh, the head uh, to the top of the pro production. So, for example, this end subject dependency here and direct object dependency would be mapped to the labels of, uh, uh, the, depend of the parse tree. Another set of techniques for dependency parsing are based on constraint satisfaction. So, this kind of technique was introduced in the early 90s by Maruyama, Carlson, and others. So here's an example. We have some set of constraints between words and their labels and their dependencies. In this particular case, the rule says that the determiner modifies a noun on the right and its label has to be n mod. Because again, in the previous line, you see that the position of uh, the part of speech has to be before. So in general, constraint-based methods are problematic because constraint satisfaction are, is an NP-complete problem and you need a significant number of heuristics to make it work in practice. So in general, uh, the idea is to base, uh, to, to represent a sentence in the form of a constraint graph that includes a core grammar with domains, nodes, and constraints, and to find an assignment that doesn't contradict any of the constraints. And if more than one assignment exists, then you should add some additional constraints to further narrow down your choices for the parse. A third type of category of uh, dependency parsing uh, techniques are based on deterministic parsing. So this was done by many different people, including Covington, but most recently by the Maud parser created by Joachim Niver and his colleagues. So you, the Maud parser method is very similar to a shift-reduced parser for context-free grammars. And it reduces the, uh, the reduce operator creates dependencies with the head on either the left or on the right. So that essentially creates dependency arcs to the left and to the right. There's also techniques based on graphs, uh, more specifically the techniques based on maximum spanning trees that were pioneered by McDonald and Pereira and some others around 2005. So one issue with uh, dependency parsing is uh, projectivity and non-projectivity. So if you look at the sentence here, where did you come from last year? You will see that according to one of the parses, the one that is shown above the sentence, you don't have any crossing links. Whereas the parse on the bottom has come connected to year and from connected to where. So if you allow your dependency trees to include crossing dependencies like this, you have what is known as a non-projective dependency tree. Uh, it turns out that this is more of a problem for languages with free word order, such as Russian and Czech, and not so much for English. So that's why in English there's quite a lot of literature that includes only projective parsers in addition to the non-projective ones. So uh, let's talk about some of the specific examples about uh, dependency parsing. Uh, so, for example, the McDonald et al. paper from 2005. So the idea in the McDonald paper is that uh, the dependency parsing problem is reduced to the equivalent problem of searching for maximum spanning tree in a directed graph. And there already exist uh, well-known methods by Chu, Liu, and Edmonds that uh, work efficiently to find uh, maximum spanning trees on directed graphs. So here's an example. We have the sentence John saw Mary. We can represent this as a graph where we have the three words John saw and Mary plus an additional root word 
represented as nodes in the graph, and then we can have weights that can be determined from training data. And then when you perform the maximum spanning tree algorithm on this graph, you're going to get the parse, which looks like this root, pointing to saw, which is the main verb, and then saw in turn pointing to its two dependents, John and Mary. So one of the most popular techniques for dependency parsing in the last few years was uh, is the so-called mouth parser that was introduced by Joachim Nivre. It has undergone uh, many different changes over the years, so the version that I'm going to describe is just one of many. So it's a very similar method to shift-reduce parsing. It includes the same components as a shift-reduce parser, specifically a stack and a buffer, but it also includes a set of dependencies that correspond to the dependency arcs. So the reduce operation combines an element from the stack with one from the buffer, and the arc eager parser, which is one of the versions of the mouth parser, includes shift reduce plus a left arc and a right arc operation. So here are some examples of those four operations. In the shift example, the word gets removed from the sentence and added to the stack. In reduce, the word uh, from the top of the stack gets converted. And in the left and right arc examples, we have the word that is first in the remaining buffer combined with the words on the top of the stack to combine a new dependency. So here's an example. We have the sentence, people want to be free. Uh, at the beginning, we start with a stack that just contains the uh, symbol root. The buffer contains people want to be free, and the list of arcs uh, is empty. So the first operation here is a shift operation. We take the word people, and we move it from the buffer to the stack, leaving the rest of the words want to be free in the buffer. The next operation is a left arc operation, where we remove the word people from the top of the stack, and we combine it with the first word in the buffer, want, to create a new arc called nsubj and labeled a1. The next iteration is to combine the word uh, want with the root, so that's a right arc operation. We are removing the word want from the stack and combining it with the root node, and so on. So uh, each of the actions here is selected using a classifier uh, looking at features that are local to the current word. So there is no search involved, which makes the algorithm very efficient. And the final list of arcs that is returned at the end of the parse is the full dependency tree of the sentence. So let's look at evaluation metrics for dependency parsing. Uh, we can have labeled dependency accuracy, which is similar to the labeled constituent accuracy for traditional parsing methods. So it's just the number of correct dependencies divided by the number of dependencies that could be there. So here's an example here. We have uh, an output of a dependency parser with uh, the following standard representation. The first column is the uh, word number. Uh, the second word is the word in the sentence. The third is the head of the dependency. And then you have the part of speech of the word, and then the number of the head and the label of the dependency. So in the first example, we have unionized modifies workers. So that's word number one modifying word number two, and the name of this dependency is nmod. So what are the complexities of the different algorithms for dependency parsing? Uh, well, the projective CKY method is order of n to the fifth power. Uh, a better version by Eisner is uh, cubic. Uh, Non-projective method like MST using the Chu Liu Edmonds method for maximum spanning trees has a quadratic complexity. And finally, the mouth parser has uh, a linear complexity. So uh, it turns out that dependency uh, information is very useful for information extraction tasks. It can define different rules that tell you what sort of uh, dependency subtrees are connected with specific relations. So here's an example from a paper by Erkan et al. 2007, where uh, the goal was to identify interactions between proteins uh, in the medical literature. So you have the dependency tree of the sentence. So on top, starting with demonstrated, uh, then it's two children being results and interacts and so on. So the full sentence is the results demonstrated that KAIC interacts rhythmically with KAIA, KAIB, and SASA. 
So you can see that in order to identify all of the protein interactions here, for example, between KAIC and KIA or between KAIC and SASA, you can look at the path that connects them in the dependency parts. So for example, KAIC is connected to KAIA using the following paths. It, first, there is a dependency named NSUBG, then there is a node called Interacts, then there is a, a dependency called PREP with, and finally it goes to SASA, and finally it gets to another dependency called conj, Conjunction AND, and finally to the node of the target KAIA. So you can train a system that has already labeled protein dependencies to identify some new pairs of protein dependencies in new text. And the system would learn patterns of this kind. Another application of dependency trees is in the so-called dependency kernel. So a dependency kernel, as described in one of the previous segments, is a technique that decides how similar two sentences are based on how similar their dependency structures are. So here we have an example from Bunescu and Mooney, 2005, where they wanted to figure out uh, what uh, relations appear in different sentences. So for example, one of the relations was protesters located at stations. And uh, the shortest path between those two words in the dependency graph goes from protesters to seas to stations. So those uh, sets of dependencies can be used in identifying how similar two sentences can be. So I'm going to conclude this segment with a few pointers, some external links uh, to resources related to dependency parsing. The first one here is uh, the data set and evaluation uh, methodology for the Kono 10 shared task on multilingual dependency parsing. Uh, there is another interesting pointer, which is one of the earliest dependency tree banks, the so-called Prague dependency tree bank. Uh, the next is uh, a wiki page about all kinds of methods for dependency parsing. And then there is a pointer to uh, the mild parser uh, method from Nivre and uh, some of the earlier dependency parsers such as uh, Dekang Lin's Minipar and the link parser from Carnegie Mellon's Dan Slater and David Temperley. And just to give an illustration of one of them, uh, this sentence here shows the first sentence of the uh, pen tree bank represented as a dependency structure. It's extracted from the viewer that comes with the Prague dependency tree bank. So the sentence here is Pierre Vinken, 61 years old, who joined the board as a non-executive director November 29th. As you can see, the uh, root is connected to join, which is the main predicate of the sentence. And then all of the modifiers of join are listed as its children, for example, will, board, and November. And then recursively, you can have all of the other dependencies shown in the tree. So for example, 29 here modifies um, November, uh, non-executive modifies director, and so on. So this is a little bit of an introduction to dependency parsing. Uh, we're going to continue in the next set of slides uh, with a topic on uh, alternative syntactic representations.